Today we're going to take a look at the history of the development of the model of the atom. What is a model? A model is a representation of something that otherwise can't be seen. Most of science is about developing models, mostly mathematical, to describe phenomena that we see and make predictions based on those models. This is our best guess as to what the world looked like back in 1571. But as we improved our technology, we were able to make better maps. The first map was made using ships. These were made using airplanes. Then, today, we have the best model of the Earth available to us currently, also known as Google Earth. As technology improves, a picture of what things look like improve. In the same way, our picture of what the atom looks like has developed over the course of thousands of years. As new technology becomes available, we're able to delve deeper into what the unseen world has to offer. Way back in the Greek days, two guys, Democritus and Lysippus, they didn't actually uh, do this, but just for the sake of fun, let's just say the two of them were sitting down underneath an olive tree one day, eating grapes, getting drunk, and one of them said, dude, I just had the most radical idea. Yeah? Yeah. If you take a grape and you cut it in half, you have half a grape? Yeah. But then if you like cut it in half again, yeah, and yeah, and then cut it in half again, and then cut it in half again, and keep cutting it in half, 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 yeah, eventually you're going to get to the smallest piece of grape you can have and still have it be a grape. It'll like be the smallest possible piece of grapeness. Dude, that is amazing. Yeah, it would be totally indivisible. You couldn't break it up anymore. Dude, what are we going to call this indivisible particle? I don't know, dude. Let's call it indivisible. And of course, the Greek word for indivisible is atomos from which we get our word, atom. Then in the 1800s, a guy named John Dalton was playing around with gas, and he came up with the concept of atomic mass. He discovered that when you decompose water, the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen's mass is one to eight. So oxygen's always gonna weigh eight times more than hydrogen when you decompose water. And he reasoned that the atom is a solid, indestructible sphere. Now again, he really had no reason to believe this. There was no experimental evidence for this. But he pictured the atom as being a solid, indestructible sphere, each atom having its own specific atomic mass. Then in 1897, along comes John Joseph Thompson, known as J.J. to his friends. He made use of an interesting development in technology, the battery. Also, the cathode ray tube, the Crookes tube. Basically, this tube, when hooked up to electricity, would cause a screen to glow. The screen was coated with zinc sulfide, which glows when it's hit with energized particles. What he realized is, if he takes these particles coming off the battery, these so-called cathode rays, and subjects them to an electric field, that the cathode rays are deflected towards the positive electrode. And based on this, he discovered the outermost particle of the atom, known as the electron. You see, because if these particles are deflected towards a positive electrode, that means the particle in question is negatively charged. And he reasoned that if it was so easy to remove this electron from an atom, the particle is called an electron because it's a fundamental particle of electricity. Thompson reasoned that because it was so easy to remove the electron from the atom, then the electron can't be all that firmly attached to the atom. He envisioned a diffuse sphere, diffuse meaning kind of foggy, cloudy, loose, a loose sphere made of negative electrons stuck in some sort of positive charge. He didn't quite have that worked out. The diffuse sphere with negative electrons stuck into positive charge. He called this the plum pudding model. Raisins being the negative electrons and the pudding being the rest of the atom, the positive part of the atom. Nowadays, we call this the chocolate chip cookie dough model, where the cookie dough is positively charged and the chocolate chips are the negatively charged electrons that are embedded in it that you can pluck out because they're so delicious. Then along comes Ernest Rutherford. Ernest Rutherford discovered the alpha particle. He also discovered that the alpha particle was positively charged. He tried to do all kinds of things with the alpha particle, including shooting it at another element to see what would happen. He carried out the first artificial transmutation. We looked at that in the previous unit. Something else he did was he used alpha particles, shot at thin foils of gold to see what would happen. He was putting the Thompson model to the test. 
Now, according to the Thompson model, if the atom is a diffuse sphere and shoots alpha particles at it, then the alpha particles just shoot straight through without any problem at all. But when he set up this experiment, he had a container with a radioactive sample that had alpha decay, a pinhole in one side that the alpha particles could shoot out of, a piece of gold foil, and a screen coated with zinc sulfide, everybody's favorite glow-in-the-dark stuff. He shot the alpha particles at the gold foil, expecting, if Thompson was right, for all the alpha particles to go straight through. But the results were surprising. Yeah, the vast majority of them did go straight through, but a few of them deflected off to the sides, and a few of them even bounced back. To paraphrase him, it'd be sort of like if he took a gun, shot a tissue with a bullet, and the bullet hit off the tissue, bounced back, and hit you. Here's a model of the apparatus. Here we have a screen coated in zinc sulfide. Here we have the sample where the radioactive material is. This yellow represents the alpha particles that are being shot out. This piece of copper represents the piece of gold foil. You'll notice that the majority of the alpha particles pass right through, giving us a nice glow right here. But there's also glowing in other places, including behind. Because of this, Rutherford reasoned that there must be something in an atom that's small, because if it wasn't small, more would be bouncing off, very small, very dense, and because they are repelling the positive alpha particles, whatever's in there must also be positively charged. He envisioned what's called the nuclear atom, where the vast majority of the atom is made of empty space with electrons zipping around. And in the very middle is a small, dense, positively charged nucleus. You see why this would work. If the nucleus is incredibly small, then most of the alpha particles are going to simply pass right through. But because the nucleus is positive, it will repel the positive alpha particles that get close enough. And if the alpha particles make a head-on hit, well, they'll just simply bounce right off. But because the nucleus is so incredibly small, this happens very infrequently, so the nucleus must be incredibly tiny. So the nucleus contains most of the atom's mass, it's in the center, the electrons zip around outside at a distance, and the majority of the atom's volume is empty space. Imagine this, if you will, a baseball stadium, with a baseball in the direct middle of the stadium representing the nucleus. The stadium itself represents the entire volume of the atom, and a couple of tiny little gnats, you know, those little tiny black flies that buzz around your head in the summertime, those little things at distance scattered throughout the stadium. In the case of oxygen, eight of those gnats scattered around the stadium. What's most of the space going to be made of? Nothing. The atom is mostly empty space with a small dense positive nucleus in the middle and electrons zipping around at a distance. Then came Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr said, hey, that's great. I like the nuclear atom. There's only one problem. Those negative electrons and those positive nuclei are going to attract each other. That electron should just spiral in and crash into the nucleus pretty much instantaneously. Why don't they? Now, Niels Bohr used the recent discovery of spectral lines. When you pass light through a spectroscope, it breaks it up into individual colors. And he reasoned that those colors must have come from somewhere. If you take a look at an element spectrum, no matter where you find that element, the spectrum will always be the same. So we figured the spectrum must have something to do with the structure of the atom. Where's the energy coming from? He reasoned that atoms have electrons in energy levels. And that when you give an atom energy, the electrons will rise up in energy level, and when they fall back down, they'll release that energy in the form of light. But the electrons must stay in those energy levels because the electrons have a certain amount of energy, and this is what keeps them from crashing into the nucleus. These are the spectra of certain elements. Every element has its own unique bright line spectrum. This is because every element has its own unique number of electrons, and each energy level has its own unique amount of energy. So no two elements are going to have the same spectrum, but all atoms of the same element will have the same spectrum. Every atom of hydrogen will have a purple line, blue line, green line, and red line in its visible light spectrum. And this comes from energy level drops of an electron from a higher energy level to lower energy level. So Bohr took Rutherford's model and added energy levels to it.